Welcome to the broadcast, my fruits. We've got a lot to get through today, so let's get jiggy with it. We've got some fruits to munch to begin with, followed by some vegetables, including Millie McIntosh, Harry's Trial, Jason Knauf, all kinds of things, my dears. And then the main meat of this broadcast, actually, the latter part of this broadcast will be devoted to Princess Alexandra, because there are important things to discuss, especially if you are unfamiliar with the life of Princess Alexandra. I think you'll find it most enlightening. I really do. There were many rumours during the coronation, by the way, of various sightings. One was of the Grim Reaper. People weren't sure if this dark, shadowy, silhouetted figure was either the Grim Reaper or Meghan Sussex. That was another rumour that went round. We have had confirmation that actually it was a simple, humble verger, so they say. I mean, it did look rather hyper real, didn't it, for a moment there, to see this scuttling figure. <laughs> I actually thought it was rather a delicious moment. Another delicious rumour that was doing the rounds was that the Meghan Markle was spotted in disguise in the coronation, dressed as this gentleman. People were rather tickled by it on, on social media. Well, we have had confirmation not only from BBC, who have verified that it was not Meghan Sussex, not only from People magazine, who came forward to clarify the situation for those that were concerned that it was Meghan Sussex in disguise, because, you know, People magazine, they've probably spoken to five friends of Meghan's, haven't they? They've probably had an exclusive from five friends to confirm that it's not Meghan, but also Sir Carl Jenkins, the Welsh composer, broke his silence and issued his own denial, saying, no, you needn't fear, I am not Meghan Sussex in disguise. So they are off the list and that's all done. We also need to take a moment off our thoughts and prayers to an 80-year-old lady who was hit by a police motorcycle escort as part of Sophie Edinburgh's motorcade. This is most unfortunate. It's very sad and the last I heard, she was in a critical condition and fighting for her life. This was yesterday. So I do hope that she, her condition is improving. And I'm sure you join myself and Sophie Edinburgh, who expressed thoughts and prayers for the injured lady and her family. And we'll be, not be speaking further until the accent, accident is further investigated. But horrible, horrible uh, for all involved, but especially, of course, the injured lady. And we send you our thoughts and very best wishes, my dear, for a speedy recovery. The Prince of Wales hosted an investiture ceremony at Windsor and various lionesses of the sporting world were honoured, as was Janet Kay, who had success in the 1970s with that song Silly Games. You might know the one if you Google it. It's got a very high-pitched kind of reggae-infused vibe. I absolutely loved it. And I absolutely loved seeing her there, honoured for her services to music. And somebody else was honoured. Somebody else was honoured. But more of that in a moment. I think you know who it was. First of all, a quick question that I had repeated a few times. This one came in from Laurie Stone King or Stoner King or Stonking. I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced, my dear, but you are a very regular fruit. So hello, my dear. And thank you for your question. Did anyone see the moment Camilla was anointed? Which is a very good question because we were all waiting to see an actual anointing, weren't we? Because we were told Charles would be concealed as king for his anointing, which he was. Not by the most spectacular canopy, but we'll let that go today. But we were going to see Camilla anointed. Well, as it happens, it wasn't aired or footage of it has not been aired of the actual skin on skin anointing, as far as I'm aware. It might, it might be out there somewhere. And actually what happened, my dear, is that as a certain anthem was rousing during that moment, the clergy or the bishops, whoever they were, my dear, surrounded Camilla and formed a, a sort of screen around her, a human screen during that moment and cameras panned away. But some of it, although you couldn't actually see it, you could see the moment they were sort of praying over her. It was semi sort of visible. And then right at the end, you saw the oil being wiped off of the spoon and hands being wiped on robes. So it's quite nice. Actually, and I think it's quite elegant that we didn't actually visibly see the anointing itself unless you were there in the congregation. So it still remains a semi-shrouded in mystery. And I looked back through the liturgy because it had escaped my attention as well, that moment of the holy anointing. And it seems that when he tells her, be your head anointed with holy oil, and also the first section, several lines of prayer that were uttered, I believe, because it seems they were omitted, I believe that those words must have been 
muttered in private, if you will, while the anthem was being prayed to Camilla in person rather than announced to the world uh, until further prayers. So that's that little mystery solved. Don't worry, my dear, she was anointed. But now to the subject of Jason Knauf, our hero, <laughs> our gallant hero. Yes, as I said, the Prince of Wales hosted an investiture ceremony and one of those that was rewarded and honoured, I should say, was Jason Knauf. And he has been made a lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order. Yes, in the kingdom we pronounce lieutenant, lieutenant, or anybody in the know does. And he worked for the Waleses and the Sussexes, I think, you know, for seven years in total, roundabouts. And he was awarded lieutenant. And it's not unusual for former members of staff who have served for a fairly long time and successfully, successfully to be awarded. But it is a gift of the king. It is certainly not a given. It's a gift of the king. And also the Grand Master of that particular order is the Princess Royal as well. So I would imagine that she would have had to have had some sort of approval or say so in that, even though it is a gift of the King, and it, is, it is obviously his ultimate gift. And Lieutenant is one rung less senior than a commander of the, the Royal Victorian Order. Angela Kelly, for example, is a CVO, so she is one rank, if you like, higher, but of course she worked for 25 years and was uh, best buds with the Queen, wasn't she? The late Queen, really. So, but it is also, a, Lieutenant is also a considerable upgrade from an MVO, which is simply a member of the Royal Victorian Order. So he, he could have just been made a member, but he was made a lieutenant, which is a senior impressive rank, if you will. Not to be scoffed at. He is the man that gave us a plethora, a plethora of juicy tidbits. More than many, now possibly more than most, didn't he? With all the revelations that came out in his wake and his experience of working with her. Well, Regardless of anybody else's opinion of Jason Knauf, the King and the Prince of Wales, the heir to the throne, both seem to be very impressed with him, despite character assassinations from other quarters. From other quarters. Remember what Jason Knauf told us? That Meghan had written to him in text communication about her letter to Daddy. In the unfortunate event that it leaked, it would pull at the heartstrings. Oh, daddy, daddy, daddy. Really? You thought that would pull at the heartstrings? Whose? It pulled at most people's Taurus excreta meter, my dear. That's what it pulled at. So pull the other one. Remember, Megan apologised to the court for some of those omissions and said that she's so sorry, I could not remember these exchanges. Likely story, but we believe you, don't we? <laughs> the Duchess seems intent in always having someone in her sights. She is bullying so-and-so and seeking to undermine her confidence. We have had report after report from people who have witnessed unacceptable behaviour towards so-and-so. Well, they can deny it all they want, but Jason Knauf, LVO, confirms other people's suspicions or has a different side of the lollipop to give people to lick. Millie McIntosh is the other creature that has been responsible for many column inches this week, my dear, because she has come out with some information, hasn't she? Now, for those of you that don't know, Millie McIntosh emerged into public consciousness as a cast member from a reality TV series called Made in Chelsea. It's very successful here in the kingdom and it spawned a lot of reality stars. The difference being, rather unusual at the time, is that these stars, or some of them, emerged from middle to upper classes, indeed the upper class, and some verging on aristocracy, including one of the first stars of that show was a guy called Spencer Matthews. Very good looking, handsome young chap. And they are well connected. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Spencer Matthews' brother James went on to marry Pippa Middleton. So, you know, via him, Spencer Matthews, for example, is related to our future queen. So uh, Spencer was edu uh, Eton educated as well. So uh, some of them are very much in the know. Some of them, not all of them. I don't know much about this Millie uh, Macintosh character, but uh, she seems very nice, I have to say. She seems a most pleasant gal. Uh, I mean, she was married to Professor Green for a while, the musician. Uh, let, I won't say much about that. But 
I'm sure he's a decent chap, but that, that came to a close. Anyway, she has never spoken before about this. There's lots of ruminations about her friendship with Meghan Markle, lots of speculation, lots of incorrect press stories about their friendship. Uh, but she never spoke about it. Now, this has to be to her credit. I'm not saying that she is uh, impoverished or some sort of peasant in need of money, but there's no doubt that she could have made a lot of money very quickly by selling stories and doing a Lizzie Cundy or, you know, rolling it all out there, my dear, rolling it all out there on the back of uh, this brief friendship. But she never has, and that has to go in her favour. She's been asked to speak on it a lot, but she runs a podcast. Uh, it's a very chatty podcast. And she tells the story because the subject of this podcast was ghosting. You know, when suddenly what seems to be a friend, you're blocked out of their lives. Got iced. And Megan is oft accused of this, isn't she? Well, we get the inside scoop, my dear. Thank you, Millie McIntosh. Wonderful. They met eight years ago, before any mention of Harry this sad and the fourth, and actually Millie was a great fan of Meghan's and she'd been watching her in suits. You know, I say great fan, she was enthusiastic, my dear. And they both attended, without knowing each other, the opening of an envelope. Oh, excuse me, my dear, not an envelope, what was it? A hotel, that's it. They should call this hotel the hotel envelope, shouldn't they? Uh, they both attended the opening of a hotel in Istanbul and they got on like a house on fire. You know, she loved Megan as everybody who knows M Megan, uh, you know, claims, you know, you get on so famously with her. She's wonderful. She's charming. She's a brilliant. She draws you in. And it's all about the tig, the tig tog and chinking of rosé and margaritas and all of this and had a fabulous time. And they got talking when they were ordering drinks at a bar. They stayed in touch. And whenever Megan was in town in London, and she was new to London at that time, didn't know much about it. So Millie shared her little black book, if you will, her contacts, her nail bar, took her to the Ivy on King's Road. I'm not a fan of Chelsea, I've got to tell you, or any of that Sloan Square uh, area. There was a time when I spent quite a lot of time there, and I have to tell you, there's something, there's something quite stale about it. Something quite stale. All that. Kings Road kind of area. I've never had a fabulous time there. I've been to some fabulous parties there. Now that's where the real action is, uh, around uh, Belgravia and South Kensington. Uh, that's where the real action is, my dear. But the public places never did anything for me, really. Uh, but that's what she introduced her to. It was all about yoga, strolling, well-being, healthy living, this kind of thing. They bonded, they bonded. And they bonded over the divorce because she had been through her divorce with Trevor, her Megan, and uh, Millie was going through a tumultuous, turbulent time with Professor Green, so they had that in common. They were bonding over the experience. And the last time, on the, the last time of one of these sojourns, and Millie makes it very clear that they were never best friends, best buddies, you know, they weren't exceptionally close, but they hung out a few times. When Megan was in town, she'd call Millie, they'd hang out, uh, share experiences. You know, not best buddies, but it was a burgeoning friendship, if you will, with no, not, nothing going wrong. No dramas, you know, it was nice. An ongoing blossoming friendship. But the last time she ever saw Megan was when she received an invitation from Megan to come join her. She was staying at some hotel in the Cotswolds. Now I'm reading between the lines here and imagining that it might have been Soho Farmhouse, which is one of the Soho, uh, Soho House Group hotels. So they hung out together, had a fabulous time, were photographed on their bikes, biking around. She thought it would be more, Millie thought it would be more a yoga and chill affair, but she says that that became a uh, rosé and margarita affair in the swimming pool. Really fun, really fun, but that was the last time that they ever crossed paths. It was on this day that Megan told Millie McIntosh about Prince Harry, that they had been introduced by a friend and they were messaging and they were going to see where it went. Oh, we'll see where it goes. You know, he's just a prince, you know. Very casual, my dear, very casual. We all know behind the scenes he was plotting. I want to be queen, I want to be queen. Well, she played it down. She played it down. Millie had never met Prince Harry, still hasn't met Prince Harry. So she didn't ask much about it or think much more about it until weeks or even months later, it hit the press and everything went wild and the media attention was intense. And 
Millie says that she had had her run-ins with the press. She had had a lot of press attention, not on the same scale whatsoever, she makes very clear, but she said that she understood how overwhelming it could be and that it could be unpleasant. And so she messaged her. Uh, she said, you know, I hope you're okay. I'm thinking of you. But she received a message back from Megan that was abrupt. And she will not spill the beans of what this message said, but she says, you know, she makes it very clear that it was a full stop. It was a full stop on their friendship. Uh, although she hadn't been intrusive, she hadn't tried to intrude on Megan's privacy, hadn't asked her any questions. She simply asked, are you doing okay? You're fine, you know, basically, I'm here if you, if you need any help. Or, uh, anyway, merely thought that what Megan required was a little bit of space and time, you know, handle all of this. But she was expecting that Megan would eventually come back to her when she had a moment to herself, you know, just to say, sorry if I was a little bit rash there. I was going through an intense time. If I came across angry, I didn't mean it. Uh, but it never came. Millie says, she cut me dead. It felt like she had told her to rack off, should we say, as the Australians would put it, to rack off, but not quite, to rack off, basically. So I did. And we haven't spoken since, she says. And Millie says that her instinct was that Megan's thinking was, right, I'm going to be royal now. I don't need Millie in my life. And Millie asks, what could I offer her at that point? She had met her prince. I can't be associated with Millie McIntosh. So get rid, get rid. That was how it felt. Millie was very fair and said there are always two sides to a story. She said she wished that she could just ask her what happened so she could get her side of it. Perhaps, you know, Rachel could have been just so overwhelmed or so scared about any leaking of anything at all that she just put up the, the barriers, the walls went up and perhaps overshot it a bit. Maybe she was advised by others to drop all her celebrity charms, but whatever reason it is, and she could have what she considers good reasons for cutting people off. You have to consider the fact that she put herself out there as such a caring woman, so thoughtful, you know, who doesn't care what other people think uh, about her. So, you know, she, she would never betray her friends, her confidences. Well, it seems like she didn't think twice about shutting Millie McIntosh out. I just wasn't useful anymore, says Millie. And she says it's hurtful because they did get on really well. And she doesn't wish her any bad. She just wish wishes that she knew, you know. It wasn't just like a Piers Morgan who claims they went for lunch once and then she was cut off. I can understand that, actually. I can even understand it from a few other people in the press who have complained that they've been ghosted, but I can't really understand it uh, in regards to Millie McIntosh. We must turn to the subject of Prince Harry and his trial. And High Court documents this week are suggesting that tabloid stories that Harry claims were obtained unlawfully came from Harry himself. <laughs> himself. Yes, this is interesting. And the defence appear to have provided evidence for this, including an interview that Harry gave himself to mark his 18th birthday. You should be getting your ducks in a row, Haribold. You really should. Because Harry has put forward 140 newspaper articles that were published in under Mirror Group newspapers, so Daily Mirror, Sunday Mirror and The People, uh, from 1996 to 2010. And he alleges that they were all obtained through illegal means. Uh, and of these articles, 33 of them have been put forward and selected as a sample of articles on which to base his case and his allegations. And just as two or three examples here of where they have rebuffed his claims. These include a story from September of 2002, which was entitled No Eaten Trifles for Harry, who's turned 18. And Mirror Group newspapers argue that this came from information that he gave during an interview for his 18th birthday. He gave it to the Press Association news agency, and it was arranged by the Duke's own advisors in an exercise to rehabilitate his image. You know, he talks about how Camilla was so Machiavellian in the reimagining of her image and her rehabilitation. Well, this was an exercise to rehabilitate his image following his early involvement in drug taking. Puff piece. And this was apparently released under embargo, and then from that, different versions were published in most newspapers, which is the way it goes, isn't it, my dear? 
So the information that he claims was obtained, obtained unlawfully came from his gob. That is what we're seeming to uncover. It's all to do with memoirs, as we keep hearing about a memoir, a memoir, the art of memoir, the, the memoir. Chuck Harry, his pack of gouloirs and the beret and the French café, uh, mes chéris. A memoir, a memoir, painting a new picture of reality. We see you. Ooh la la, ooh la la. Well, Harry complains again that a further article published by the Press Association on his birthday stated that he would be spending his birthday at Highgrove and MGN rebuff Harry's allegations and speak about their article in the mirror covering this, saying that it simply repeated the details that the claimant had given, that he would be having no party, that he would be spending the day with his father and brother and that his uncle gave him golf clubs because he had spoken about it in an interview. And that is all their story said. Then, going back to 1996, there was a story about Diana in the Daily Mirror, which suggested that Diana looked sad and upset after a 20 minute visit to Harry's school on his 12th birthday. And it added that Prince Charles had spent most of the afternoon with Harry, who had taken the divorce very badly and was distressed over the health of Paddy the Royal Gardener. So Harry seems to be inferring that they obtained this information unlawfully, but Mirror Group newspapers have come back and said that the Diana visit was confirmed publicly by her spokesman, while members of the public had seen her visiting too, and they argued that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy and respect to taking the divorce badly, because Diana had spoken of Harry's re reaction in her own Panorama interview in 1995. So she had put that information out there. She was invading his privacy there. And can I please also mention at this point that as much as there is a squillion things that I adored about Diana, her recklessness was not one of them. And we all know that she blab, blab, blabbed because it's there in tapes that were provided to her voice coach teacher where she revealed the most intimate things. I mean, how stupidly reckless was that I mean, it was either stupidly reckless, dangerous to an absurd degree, or cray-cray. Take your pick, but you cannot tell me that it was not one or all of those things. I mean, hideously irresponsible, the things she came out with, to a voice coach, while she knew she was being fully recorded. Ah, and she was Princess of Wales at the same time. Ah, you know. uh, Harry blames the press. I'm not saying they don't have to take their fair share, but come on, come on. I ask you. While Harry's close relationship to his gardener was well documented and so was his illness, apparently. Well, I can't confirm that, but that's what Mirror Group newspapers say in their defence. And one final example, in a, another story from November 2000, it was revealed that Prince Harry broke his thumb. And but Mirror Group newspapers say that this was placed into the public domain by the palace and had been reported by several papers the previous day, including BBC Online with St James's Palace spokeswoman speaking about it. Well, if this is true, and if these defences are true and prove to be true, how embarrassing. How embarrassing for Harry and his legal team. You know, if you're going to complain about something, get your ducks in a row, my dear. Quack, quack, quack. Get them in a row. Otherwise, well, we've nibbled some fruit and munched some veg, and now it is on to the meat of this uh, three-course banquet. Oh dear, I ain't got no pudding in, have I? Oh well. Princess Alexandra is rather delicious, so I suppose we can call her a royal pudding too, can't we, my dear? And now we are going to have a chat about Princess Alexandra, and it is a cautionary tale. It is a cautionary tale, and very interesting, because I've had so many questions uh, after her appearance at the coronation. Who is she? What does she do? Uh, who is this random old lady sitting next to Harry and why was she seated next to him? Well, the reasons might become very clear when you hear about her story, my dears, and it really is very interesting. It really is. And while I'm about to tell you about Alexandra's life, may not be especially interesting to those of you who know about her, because I'm sure some of you will know about her life, but for newcomers, 
you might find this re really rather revealing because nothing is new under the sun, my dears. And she is worth knowing about. She is 86 years old. She is the first cousin to the late Queen Elizabeth. And also, because she is exceptionally royal, she's a double royal, there ain't no muggle about her, my dear, because she is also the first cousin once removed to Prince Philip. So a double royal there. And her life is a lesson. It is a lesson to Harry specifically about how ephemeral our existence is and also how fame is a flame that flickers and dies. Because the world, when they looked at that coronation, for those of them that don't know about Alexandra, they just saw some old biddy, some, you know, some sweet looking confection next to Harry that they don't recognize. But what they don't realize, my dear, and it's so interesting that what they, is, what they were regarding at that moment in time, that old lady next to Harry, was one of the most celebrated, thrilling, glamorous, and exciting royals of the previous century. One of the stars of mid-century 1900s and an, an international celebrity, to use a vulgarism, my dear, an international celebrity of the 1950s and 60s. And as she sits there in Westminster Abbey, she is one of the very few people to have been married in Westminster Abbey all those years ago. She, when she was married there, there were the same number of guests as there are for the coronation, 2,000. The streets outside, if you look, there is plenty of footage online. As there's marvellous footage going back, sleeping on the streets, camping on the streets. It makes that Sussex wedding look like some sort of gingangooly around a campfire, my dear. These people were out on the streets camping, uh, queuing for miles to see this fabulous princess because there weren't, I think she was the only royal princess aside from princesses Elizabeth and Margaret Rose of that era. Certainly the only visible one. So she was extremely glamorous. She was the most eligible bacheloress in the world at the time. And it was a rare honor for her to be married at the Abbey. And it was watched, her wedding was watched by 200 million people worldwide. And a lot of that would have been at the Picture Palace, the cinemas of the era. Big deal. And isn't it strange? Nobody knows her now. And please, you don't have to come up and say, I know who, I know who, we, some of us. You know, I'm talking generally, my dear. Queen Elizabeth, King Charles, King William, they are history. The likes of Princess Alexandra, the good, and Prince Harry, the rotten, are footnotes in history that will not be remembered. The lessons of her life are a specific reminder to Prince Harry, and both of them lost one parent in a tragic crash at a young age, both experienced press intrusion, and she, now this is the interesting bit, she has a daughter who was a wild child of her era and spoke publicly on national television and sold her story to a tabloid criticizing her parents, Princess Alexandra and Angus Ogilvy. Yes, yes, my dear, she has been there seen it all, done it all, and she's been plonked next to Harold as a living, breathing, 86-year-old reminder that nothing ain't new under the sun and just sort yourself out, my dear. And she was in the late Elizabeth's inner circle, innermost circle, for eight decades, and in 1963 she married a commoner, a commoner businessman, businessman Angus Ogilvy, Sir Angus Ogilvy, he didn't have a title. It is believed that he rejected a royal title. I can't confirm that. I've got to tell you, he was absolutely divine for my money. He was. Too lean for my taste, to be perfect. Too lean. But the face, when in moving footage of him, when he's in animation, you know, in his uh, sort of summer season, really, the younger years, I thought he was exquisite. I've some, seen some of him looking so royally handsome gorgeous not so good in photographs in some of them, some of them it's a particular kind of taste but i thought absolutely stunning man and she's always had an attractive air uh, and elegance i must say i don't find her walk especially elegant 
Well, feminine, I should say, not especially feminine, because she had something of the tomboy about her spirit. And I don't find her a classic beauty, actually. That's not to say that I don't find her beautiful, because I do, just not in the classic sense. You can see some of the other royals in her face, uh, such as Princess Anne, a few of them, actually. But, you know, she's always put me in mind of Margaret Thatcher in her younger years, because Margaret Thatcher as well. Some may not believe it, but uh, she was considered very attractive, and she had a very charismatic attractive appearance and smile and air about her. And I see a similar effect in the younger Princess Alexandra. She was born in 1936 on Christmas Day as it happens. And she is the daughter of Prince George, the Duke of Kent, who was the younger brother of the late Queen's father, King George VI. And the reason that there were two Georges, by the way, was her father and also King George VI, is that King George VI, his real name was Albert, known as Bertie, but his regnal name was George, so he became George when he became king. It all gets rather confusing, doesn't it? But her father was the original George of the family, Prince George, Duke of Kent, and he married Princess Marina of Greece and Denmark. And she was another that was exceptionally royal, my dear, because as well as the Greece and Denmark connections, and her connections to Prince Philip, of course, her mother was a Grand Duchess of Russia. So that is where the Russia connection comes in from as well. True European royalty, my dear, true. But before Marina had married into this royal family, to the Duke of Kent, there had been a lot of political instability and the Greek royal family was out of favour and she'd found herself forced into exile, more or less. Uh, so she knew, she understood that royalty needed to be popular with the people to survive because it had been illustrated to, to her very plainly. She was in exile. You know, they must be useful. This is where it comes from. And um, so Alexandra, the young Alexandra, was instructed in the art of being royal. Very similar, actually, to Queen Mary, who is the paternal grandmother to Princess Alexandra and the late Queen Elizabeth. So that's where they had that connection for the grandmother. And also the connection of Princess Marina being a great uh, fan is the wrong word, enthusiast or lover of royalty, just like Queen Mary. Mary of Tech, you know, they were true, yes, I will say it, they were fans of royalty. They loved and appreciated being royal and they very much made it clear that you are there to serve, as we saw repeated over and over again during the coronation, to get the message across to people. It's not about them being served. Yes, they get served their breakfast in the morning, whatever. they've got a busy job to do, my dear, and possibly get their underwear ironed, all kinds of things, my dear bottoms wiped, who knows, but their whole business is about service to us, us here in the, in the country, the Commonwealth and the, the old empire, my dear, <laughs> who knows, this was what was drummed into them and that is why you see the exemplary service of the, the late Elizabeth uh, because of that influence and also uh, on the likes of Princess Alexandra who would choose royalty over anything as we will see later. She grew up in Coppins in Berkshire, uh, which was the home of the Kent family, and it was rather idyllic. It was rather bohemian. Her parents were very free-spirited, and Cecil Beaton was always coming over. He was very busy with the royals, wasn't he? He got in and out of everywhere. It was about art. It was about beauty. It was parties, 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 full of gaiety, gay, gay, gay. Very, very happy times, very happy times. So then what happens? Death death and destruction. War impending, my dear, war impending. Yes, that Enid Blyton childhood came to an abrupt end. Princess Alexandra was five years old, five or six, this was in 1942, and her father had joined the RAF that year, and he was commissioned to fly to Iceland to review troops at that time, but his aircraft hit some mountains. They hit a mountain near Caithness in Scotland. I think it was Caithness. And it burst into flames, came down, and he perished and died. 
So she was left without a father at the age of five. Princess Marina was left without a husband. And also, by the way, their two other children were or are Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, who we've seen this week, still a working member of the royal family, and Prince Michael of Kent, who you will also see uh, and saw in the royal family photograph recently. So they're still familiar faces, but yes, they were all half orphaned by the death of their father with the plane crash. And this had a lot of obviously emotional ramifications, but also financial ones, because as a widow, Princess Marina, she had no entitlement at that time to the £25,000 a year that had been received by Prince George during his lifetime. No, that stopped. There was no provision for royal widows. So many possessions at that time were sold, actually, to raise funds. And also after the war, that is when Princess Alexandra began spending more time with her cousins. Elizabeth and Margaret Rose, you see, because she lacked that 2.4 children homestead. So she got to spend more time with her cousins. And she's actually, or was, I think there's 10 year age gap between she and the late queen. So there was quite a gap. But as you know, and will have been told, Elizabeth was a very mature child. She had a, an old head on young shoulders from a very young age. She was her father's pride and Margaret Rose was her father's joy. That's how he described them, my pride and joy, because little Margaret Rose brought a lot of uh, naive gaiety to proceedings. Uh, some young, pretty grace, whereas the young Elizabeth was born mature and well-rounded, uh, a natural queen, even though she hadn't, her family had no idea she would be queen at that moment. She was his pride. And so she had that maturity and, that was beyond her years. And that is why she jived very well with Princess Alexandra, despite their 10 year age gap. And the friendship was born and clothes were shared. The late queen would share her hand-me-downs with Alexandra, who didn't have as much money in the family. And Alexandra was educated at boarding school. Marina took the decision to send her off to an independent boarding school, which was unusual, especially for a royal princess of the era they would normally be raised by nannies, the governess affair, you know, but that is where uh, she was. And in some ways she was regarded as a rather gauche young child in her, in her spring season, but gauche in a good way, very high spirited and rather tomboy. But she would continue to spend her school holidays with Princess Elizabeth at Sandringham and Windsor and lots of Christmases together, this kind of thing. And she also witnessed courtship between the young Princess Elizabeth and the dashing young Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark. And so much so that it was she who was selected bridesmaid for their wedding. She was only 10 years old. She looks much older in photographs, but she was just 10 years old she was. Throughout that era and later in her spring season, season you know she was deft in her role she never caught to publicity and this goes for the rest of her life that was of no interest to her whatsoever and it was a flareful charitable work that became apparent even in those early years of the spring season charitable work humanitarianism service because she added up here she added up here from princess marina and from queen mary so at 15 years old, she began working with the British Red Cross, and that continues to this day, to this day, 70 years thence at least. Quiet commitment, my dear, quiet commitment. And she trained in nursing at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. So that gave her an advantage when it came to talking with people, especially in difficult circumstances. You know, if you know anything about her now and her patronages, and I'm talking, you know, over a hundred of them, my dear, she's still involved with, and they all speak very highly of her and her involvement, how important her involvement is. Uh, you know, Alzheimer's, cancer research, uh, lots of medical things she's involved in, as well as humanitarianism. Goes on and on and on, but her potential as a goodwill ambassador was recognised very early on. Uh, and that is the difference, you know, between royalty, as we've discussed before. She wasn't an activist. She didn't have some political lobbying to be getting on with. It doesn't mean that she didn't have her own convictions privately, but they were private. That is what is concealed when you are a royal. Service first, service first. Harry has had this drummed into him 
seems to have forgotten about it. We've got our own kind of service. Meghan, well, I've got much criticism for Meghan, but the reason I have more for Harry is because he is the one that was raised to know better. It's also interesting to note, by the way, that at that time there were far fewer working royals, back going back to the you know, 40s, 50s, fewer actually than there became to be in 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, when there was, when they'd sort of puffed up. There were far fewer, so it's interesting. It's kind of increased, then slowly decreased over time. And it's time we started getting a few back in, but it hasn't always been a, a very large, visible working royal family. So seems to come and go. And she began being sent off on missions on behalf of the Queen, such as one to Canada at the age of 17, accompanying her mother, Marina. And she was adored. She took Canada by storm, by storm. And Tyler Perry wasn't even there to greet her and offer her a great big mansion. But somehow she seemed to cope. And she got on with the ribbon cutting and the plaque unveiling, uncomplainingly, unfailingly, understanding what a privilege it was. So much so that she was rewarded, if you want to put it that way, or I'm sure the Harkles wouldn't view it as a reward, but she, was, she did a solo tour of Australia at the age of 23. And again, she was a huge hit. She was a fabulous ambassador. And she didn't seem to mind or find it a belittlement that she was out doing business on behalf of the Queen. But they, she even had a waltz, an Australian waltz, written in her honour. And comparisons have been made to her as a role model for Diana, or perhaps some figurehead of what was to come, because she had an air of accessibility that hadn't really been seen before. She was more down to earth than the other princesses. Uh, although when it comes to Diana, you could say she was away with the fairies rather than down to earth. But, you know, and she kind of cut out a model for the royal walkabout, what came to be known as the royal walkabout. The Queen then sent her on to a trip to Japan, and this was a very important diplomatic trip of great nuance and subtlety. This was soon after the war, and she was representing the Queen, so this was paving the way for reconciliation. It was a very important trip, and she was entrusted with it. She did splendidly. And it was at this time, as I say, she was approaching, mid well, she was in midsummer now. And this was when Cecil Beaton described her as an icon of beauty. And the column inches began. And this is actually when she began shimmering. Remember, I spoke to you recently about how I like royalty, not just to be made up of colour, but also of shimmers. And but this is when I think she began to shimmer. It was the frosting on the cake for Princess Ale Ale Alexandra. And she gave us what we want from a royal princess, you know, some splendour. And that was wonderful to see and enjoyable. However, when she was on her honeymoon, you know, she got married, as we've discussed before, to Angus Ogilvy. Uh, splendid wedding. But then on the honeymoon, this is where a little bit of mischief came into play because she was photographed. Long lens. You know, Catherine experienced this. Fergie experienced this. Now, I don't know if any toe sucking was involved in this particular encounter, but it was compromising photos. Nobody knows. Well, I certainly don't know what those photos were. I'm intrigued, aren't you? But of course, I'm pleased that they were never published, but it was a bit of a scandal at the time. They had no way of knowing that they're going to be photographed, at, you know, these long lenses, and all these apparatus, and, you know, the interest for the royal family royal family was growing and the age of deference was drawing to a close you know so people were becoming bolder and braver including the paps of the time uh, so uh, in the wake of that she had her fingers burnt who knows what they were up to my dears but lucky her with Angus with old Sir Angus so subsequently she kept a lower profile that doesn't mean that the work stopped that intensified but the public profile you know it didn't come to complete close but it was Lower. She had her fingers burned, but she didn't make a big issue of it. Uh, and her discretion began earning respect, a lot of respect with the Queen. You know, she was a rare confidant of the Queen. Princess Alexandra was made godmother to Prince Andrew, and Charles selected her as godmother to Prince William. So, yes, Harry is sitting next to Prince William's godmother, too. But this is where it gets a little bit more juicy and a little bit more interesting because as fabulous as any parent can be when you're a Princess Alexandra or Sir Angus Ogilvy or 
a Prince Charles. As fabulous as any parent can be. It does not guarantee that you don't get wayward children, my dear. One child grows up to be one who just loves to learn. And another child, well, you know the song, my dear. Her daughter, she had a son, James, and she had a daughter, Marina Ogilvy. Again, not titled because her father wasn't titled. So this is the second Marina we're talking about today. This is the daughter. Marina Ogilvy was a wild child. <laughs> and I say this with no disparagement because I would put myself in that category as well, my dear. So what can I say? We all have our moment. She was a wild child <laughs> in 1989. Pregnant. Yes, shock horror, pregnant. Living in sin with a commoner. Uh, a freelance photographer. Hmm. So not many prospects there, but no intention to marry she had. No intention to marry. Living in sin, pregnant, up the duff, bun in the oven. Yes, a princess's daughter. <laughs> so what did she do? Sold her story to the tabloids. Sold her story to the tabloids and appeared on Kilroy, which is a daytime television show of the time, in a tell-all interview. Do you see how some, something so royal like Princess Alexandra can produce something rather undignified? We cannot accuse Prince Harry of being the only member of that family to make such a sidestep, can we? The young Marina claimed that she received a horrendous reaction from her parents, including Princess Alexandra, and a furious confrontation took place. <laughs> and apparently Alexandra said to her, you have got two options. Either you... I should... <laughs> Alexandra's got quite a special voice, but you have got two options. Either you get it aborted straight away, or we arrange for you to get married by special licence. So she said, abort it straight away, or special marriage licence. Now, this is what... Marina claims and she says that her father told her that there hasn't been an illegitimate birth in the royal family for 150 years that we know about uh, and she said look I am your daughter what comes first the queen the country or your daughter <laughs> and I love this bit he answered queen and country <laughs> yes I love that so this was what it was at the time my dear and she wrote, she says that she wrote to her dear cousin Lilibet, Marina. And she said, I know that the Queen is wise and a caring woman. I just hope she can help my parents see sense. And this was the same year, by the way, that Anne separated from Captain Mark Phillips after 16 years of marriage. So, there, you know, this was the start of quite a period of unpleasantness for the late Elizabeth all the divorces and all the Annus Horribilis and everything but Marina claimed that Princess Alexandra cut her off from her monthly allowance when she refused to get married at once do you see the similarities here between Harry and Marina yes accusing them of cutting her off financially accusing them of all kinds of nastiness well, a statement was issued on behalf of Alexandra and Angus from their aides saying that they are concerned at the number of inaccuracies. Recollections may vary. In particular, they have not cut off their daughter. Marina is always welcome in her home, in her home. They love her very much. Similarities here with Charles. They love her very much and feel deeply for her at this difficult time. Do you see the similarities? Dramatic children whose recollections may vary, who might have even been influenced by their bows of the era as well. Uncaring parents, uncaring family, when every other piece of evidence points to something really rather quite contrary. Well, young Marina, after seven years, eventually divorced uh, the young gentleman that lasted seven years you know and I, as I've said before they call it the seven year itch don't they my dear and actually I found that there is some truth in that 
if there is to be trouble in a marriage. I found that there is some truth in around that period of seven years. Anyway, that didn't last. Princess Alexandra remains committed to the royal family. And she was given the, well, she is a member of the most noble order of the Garter, which is the most senior order of knighthood in the British honours system. And there's only, there's no more than 24 members of that order at any one time in the living moment. And even Margaret Rose was not gifted that honour by the late Queen, but Alexandra was. So she was one of the Queen's very closest confidants, loyal to the death. And you have to consider that when she is placed next to Harry. Because what you are seeing is dignity sitting next to vulgarity, right in front of our very eyes. You see nothing is by accident. You see the portrait painted there through the art of memoir. <laughs> Ooh la la. Do you see the portrait being, the, the painting sketched there? She was loyal to the late queen, to her death, to the point where her daughter says that she even demanded an abortion uh, to, to save face. Now, you are allowed to make up your mind whether or not you believe the daughter Marina's version of events or Princess Alexander, who says recollections may vary. And of course, you, I don't want a discussion about the rights and wrongs or uh, abortion or this kind of thing or what you know but you get to decide who was the cruel one who wasn't the same when it comes to Harry and Charles but I find it very interesting to draw the comparison to see the comparison to see the reminder right in front of us to have the reminder of celebritydom Harry is sitting right but possibly went over his head just like that red plume but if he was to take the lesson of being plonked next to Princess Alexandra, you know, he is sitting next to a woman, a celebrated beauty of her era that scintillated and was admired on a mass scale, on a more epic scale than he or his wife could even hope, could even hope for over a number of years. Yes, just because you don't see it now, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Time and space is an illusion, my dears. And now, yes, she is largely overlooked and forgotten. And most of the world don't know who she is. Well, guess what? That time will come for you and your clan too. While your brother and his kin and his issue remain figures of history. Um, and that is not to put figures of history on some sort of pedestal over mere mortals or the peasants and the commoners and the hoi polloi. Not, not at all, my dear. But it is about knowing your part and placement in that royal family and monarchy. Not getting too big for your boots and understanding a bit about real service, real loyalty, real dedication that is unwavering and also what the soft power of gentle, strong work that gets it's the quality of admiration, isn't it? It's the quality of admiration that the likes of Princess Alexandra still receives as compared to the quality of admiration that your clan, uh, Sussexes, might receive from a minority of complete and utter fruitcakes and fruit loops. So I hope that was enlightening and illuminating, or at least a little bit interesting for those of you who have seen her face but don't know who she is. Yes, she was Cecil Beaton's icon of beauty and she is an icon of royalty. She is one who channels the royal spirit. And so she is one that I most certainly look to for inspiration. And I couldn't be prouder of that type of royal. So I wanted to share with you some highlights from her life. It's certainly not the whole story, but some of the upstands and a couple of the major uh, controversies that I thought were in very interesting and I found it incredibly interesting how she of all people nothing by accident how she of all people had been placed right next to him yes she Harry is a living reminder of what it means to be royal and also a warning shot she has ended up with a convivial relationship with Marina so she understands that despite all the nastiness that went before and the mud slinging, daughter came home, that marriage ended, 
the newspapers, yesterday's newspapers became today's fish and chip papers, as we say here in the kingdom. So it is the ephemeral nature of things, of stardom, of celebrity, of infamy, and perhaps even some aspects of royalty that need to be drummed into him because he's fast approaching the autumn of life and while he may think of himself as some sort of summer hero, winter can either be a cosy place or a very cold place depending on the cards you play during your spring, summer and autumn seasons. So if he wants to cosy up next to the cottage coal fire in his winter years then he'd better start busting out some decent moves right now instead of all this mischief and silliness. Otherwise it will be a frigid, gelid, freezing, bitterly cold winter with no room at the inn, my dear, and will be shuddering and shaking in the snowdrift. So that is up to him right now. Look to Princess Alexandra for your inspiration. Harold, my boy. See you next time, my lovers. Thanks for joining me. Leave me your thoughts and pay a visit to my privy purse in the description box if you care to treat me to a cup of tea. <laughs> I'll see you next time, my dears. Toodaloo and ta-ra. Toodle-pip! <laughs>